Well, hello, my friend. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Is this the real Ken Wilbur? Is this the real Nathaniel? I didn't recognize his literary style lately with these okie dokie references. Et cetera. <laughs> I, wondered oh. whether, I wondered whether or not he'd been kidnapped by some Far Eastern sect and they had put an imposter in his place. <laughs> with not much ability to capture his literary style. <laughs> Where is our Ken Wilbur and what have you done with him? I'm, I'm, you know, I'm pushing the far edges of Alzheimer's. I'm exploring new dimensions in dumbness. I, you know, what can I say? Listen, if anybody does not suffer from Alzheimer's, it's you. <laughs> if anybody does suffer from Alzheimer's in this conversation, it's me. <laughs> oh, God, I don't know. I, I, I think you and Mike Murphy are going to just keep going. I don't, I don't see any signs of you two. I think both of you have a portrait in the attic someplace. It just looks like hell. But you guys just seem to keep plugging. Well, uh, how old is Mike? Well, he's, you know, you guys are neck to neck. Uh, he, you know, he's getting up there. I don't want to, you know, embarrass the man. But, he, you know, I, I, some, some people just seem to keep getting better. I don't know what it is. It's really interesting, actually. Well, it must be all of that um, clean living and clear thinking that you're well known for. It has something to do with that, I'm sure. <laughs> and, uh, and a lot to do with being fascinated by the work. Well, let's just, let's do that because you're, oh God, I mean, your adult professional life has just been, and is, the stuff of uh, stories and movies. Um, going back, you were, what were you, you were in your teens when you met Anne, weren't you? I met Ayn Rand one month before I turned 20, God. March 1950. We have, you know, I, I, as, I, as I've told you, I, I mean, you and I, have, you know, we go back a long ways. I just, I think the world of you, I'm, it's been really glad to have you in my life. And we've always, I think, really kind of sort of turned each other on, in a sense, really fired each other up. And, and, and we've always enjoyed each other's company. And I, you know, I tend to, th I look back over your life and your trajectory, though, and it's just astonishing. Um, we were going to talk a little bit about it, I and mean, we, you know, we need no particular order of this necessarily, but I'd mentioned to you that I was thinking of your adult life anyway, your professional life anyway, as sort of up to the day, kind of in three parts, and one... You actually wait a minute, wait a minute, Ken, I don't want to be here under false pretenses. My adult life doesn't begin for another month. <laughs> yeah, but we're talking yeah, chronologically, not emotional age yet, yeah, I understand. Um, well, you know, and, and there's almost kind of 20-year chunks. I mean, you, your professional life and your career, your career in writing, psychology, and philosophy just happen to coincide with bumping into a woman who is, you know, a, a towering figure. Well, and the story, yes. Yeah, well, I was going to say, it's, it's roughly about 20 years there until you're, you're um, parting with, with Ian in, uh, in 68. Uh, 68. Right. And then another... About the same kind of chunk, I tend to think that up into the mid '80s or so, where I think the period when you broke up with Anne up to around the '80s, mid '80s, '90s is is sort of when you were solidifying your your own philosophy and particularly the psychology of self-esteem, which you pioneered and continuing to to formulate your own philosophy. Obviously, influenced by Anne, but really stating your own sort of case, so to speak. And then some, sometime in the mid-80s, plus or minus a decade, your interest started to kind of expand into, I think, areas that certainly would go outside of, of some of the normal ones, including spirituality and transpersonal psychology. And, and, That's and all correct. And, you know, kind of up to today and on to tomorrow. So and I must say, I mean, you're quite right, and, and that process is very definitely continuing very, very actively in my present life. And right. maybe that's a better answer than I gave you before about why the passion is still there. Yeah, well, and I think passion's a good, uh, I think passion is a really good phrase to define, you know, your interest in this field anyway. And occasionally I've had people um, refer to, you know, my own interest in this field as passionate as well. And I happen to think that's one of the really great adjectives and one of the really great defining terms for it. So passion is certainly what you had when you were, 19. Well, actually, to really give the listener the context, I have to go back to when I was 14. Yeah. And I'm living in Toronto, and I'm hearing my sister, seven years older than me, reading something from a book, and two other girls are listening mesmerized. Wow. And 
after, and I'm sort of sitting in the a chair a few feet away with the teenage condescension, you know, that's only likely to be there when you're 14. <laughs> but after the girls left, they left this book on the coffee table, and I picked it up, The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. Yeah. And I began to read, and I disappeared from this earth for the next two days or three days until the book was finished. Right. And it was an electrifying, electrifying experience for me. It really made the most profound impact on all of my later development. Right. Uh, but, but the interesting thing was my mother became alarmed at, at the fact that I was neglecting schoolwork. And just, I was more <laughs> interested in discussing philosophy than learning, you know, school stuff. And uh, there was this lady who my mother regarded as a kind of a professional intellectual. And uh, she wanted me to explain to this lady what this book was about so that mother would know whether or not to worry. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I read her the famous Rourke's courtroom speech. Yeah. And the woman very pleasantly said, well, th this is not a new philosophy. This is anarchism. Now, I didn't know what anarchism was, yeah. but I felt intuitively certain that she was mistaken. Yeah. And indeed she was. But anyway, the next day I played hooky from school, and I went down to one branch of the Toronto Public Library, and I asked the librarian to help me find books on, on uh, anarchism. Yeah. And the first book she gave me was a book by Bertrand Russell called Proposed Roads to Freedom, Socialism, Syndicalism, and Anarchism. Oh, God. <laughs> And that was how I discovered professional philosophy, yeah. political philosophy in particular. Yeah. And uh, that took a hold of me. And during the next six or seven years of my life, I was reading constantly in, in psychology, in philosophy, and also in literature, because right. I also had a passion for theater and the drama. But I really used, I used to tell Ayn Rand that she kind of brought me up long distance during my adolescent years, where right. I was right. quite a lonely, quite an alienated kid. And uh, that was my alternative universe. But you were, in that sense, sort of self-educated in a lot of those fields. I was self-educated. Uh, well, so was I, had, I, so. I, I had I had one, I don't know whether you can relate to this or not, but I had one I made one mistake, which you did not make, so far as I can tell. Not yet. When I was young, <laughs> when I was young, I had the feeling at times that the whole world was in a conspiracy to get me to see things their way rather than the way they seemed to me, and that to protect my consciousness became a primary priority of mine to listen very, very critically to anything that anybody said. Right and really confirm it or disconfirm it in terms of my own understanding. Right. Now, that has an awful lot to recommend it in terms of autonomy, in terms of the obvious. But it has one serious thing against it. You lose a lot of time rediscovering or reinventing the wheel. Right. <laughs> you know? Yep. And so that cost me a lot. It gave me a lot, but it cost me a lot. Yeah. Now, wasn't it? It struck me. Wasn't um, when you and Barbara were studying with Ian? Did, wasn't there almost a, a conscious choice for you to go to college and get a certain kind of degree just because you needed a club card? Yes, emphatically. Yes, I. I really. I thought. Well, I'll get a degree in psychology. I'll. I'll practice psychotherapy, or I'll teach, or I'll do something. I'll earn my living. But my real life won't be any of that. My real life will be writing. I knew then that there was two things I wanted to do in life. One was to write books in the fields of psychology or philosophy, and the right. other was to write novels. Right. And uh, for a variety of reasons, which we'll get to later, I suppose, in this conversation, for a long time, philosophy and psychology won out and trumped fiction writing. And only in the last few years, and that's a story in itself for later, everything stopped. And I realized if I only had one book left to write in this world, and I hope I'll have more than one book, it was going to be fiction. All but right. Ser serious fiction. I serious. got it. Okay. Well, we, we, that's absolutely something I want to talk about. When did you wake up and say, that's it, I'm going to find her. I'm going to go find Ayn Rand. I'm, I'm getting well, in a car. I'm, here I go. But that's not quite how it happened. How it happened was, <laughs> I, I, you know, you must, remember, you must remember this period of history, 1950, 
every enlightened intellectual knew that socialism was a wave of the future, that capitalism was on its last legs. And how could any person at 20 even find out what capitalism was in that environment? Understood. Especially within that environment, coming from a somewhat left-wing world in terms of family, relatives, and so forth. Right. Um, but anyway, so I wrote an Ayn Rand a letter asking her a number of philosophical questions about the Fountainhead and about her first novel, We the Living. Right. And they were really challenging questions because there were things I didn't understand, political, economic, moral. And uh, she was busy writing Atlas Shrugged, and she was not at this time answering fan mail, which she got in enormous quantities because right. she was totally obsessed with the book she was writing. But she showed my letter to her husband, Frank. Right. He was impressed, and he said, you know, I answer this man. He's asking very serious, very legitimate questions, and he deserves an answer. So she wrote me quite an extraordinary long, long letter, point by point, answering the various things that I had said. And I was deeply touched and excited that she would give me that much time. And she ended the letter, and she said, uh, if you're still serious, you want to pursue ideas, and it's not just that you want to talk with a famous person, Give me your phone number, and perhaps I could find the time we could meet that we could pursue our philosophical conversation. Right. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. Yeah. <laughs> so the next thing that happened during this period, I moved from one apartment to another, and I, I got a speeding ticket driving when I when the woman phoned me that there's a letter here, and the letterhead was from Ayn Rand. Anyway, <laughs> so I then wrote her back, and I said, "Yes, I'd be, be desperately like to meet you and talk." And uh, here's my phone number. Two or three weeks later, I'm sound asleep. For some reason, I was asleep around 9.30 at night. Don't ask me why. The phone rings, and I say hello, in this thick Russian accent asks for me, <laughs> and it's Ayn Rand. Yeah. And she invited me to come to her home in, in, in San Fernando Valley yeah. on a Saturday night a few days later. And I arrived at 8 o'clock in the evening, and I stayed talking philosophy till 5.30 in the morning. And the thought going through me was, for the first time in my life, I felt, I am at home. Yeah. I am at home. And you're not even out of your teens. Well, as I said, it's a month before I turned 20. Yeah. But, you know, it was as though all my life, in my short life, but then... <laughs> I, I didn't know anybody who really had a passion for ideas. Yeah. And quite aside from issues of content, uh, there was this great sense of the passionate importance of ideas yeah. that spoke to my heart, my soul, my mind, to every part of me that I know about, and also the parts I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I guess part of the question in when I said, when did you wake up and decide that you were going to go see her, um, it, it was sort of a general one, too. Obviously, when she contacted you, that part of the decision was made, in a sense, by her. But often when people write an author or write to somebody that they you know, appreciate, it, it, it's sort of a test case. It's, they haven't really made up their mind what they would do if the person really contacted them. Did you sort of know from the, did you sort of intuit from the beginning that you just really were meant to sort of be with her, that she called up and said, let's get together? There was just no hesitation in your mind that you would do that? When do you think that, did that maybe happen even you know, three pages into the first book when you were reading um, I, it Fountainhead? Never, it never occurred to me until I read the sentence, if you are a man seriously interested in ideas and not just looking to have a conversation with a celebrity, etc. There you go. I, that sentence, in that moment, it felt like fate. That's, that's, it, it, that's, in that there moment, you go. Not, not earlier. I get it, yeah. And, you know, what Ian used to say to me and kid me later on in life, she said, one of the things that impressed me was that you were totally not afraid of me. She's, she was a very powerful woman. It was very easy to get afraid of her. Yeah. I felt totally at home. I felt safe. I felt, I understand this world. Yeah. And so it was, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, she did she. I mean, I've read your account. You've talked about the account. There's popularized accounts of, of it. The movie versions of it. When when you first the movie version is total nonsense. I know. I know. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with. Not one of us would have said the dialogue that we were given in that stupid <laughs> movie. What, let's what, not talk about that. <laughs> when you first saw her, 
What were the first words out of her mouth to you? Uh, something like, how do you do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shaking hands. Something. You know, like that we sat down. Yeah. And then she began to ask me how I happened to read The Fountainhead. Yeah. And what about The Fountainhead interested me or impressed me enough to pursue it here, etc. And um, got a little bit of my history. What, my, what was I studying in college? What were my goals or ambitions in life? Yeah. And then she said, I have three questions I want to ask you. I said, okay. And she said, the first question is, what do you think about reason? Mm. So I didn't understand the question. <laughs> um, I forget how she, she rephrased it, but she was really asking me, I guess, was I a mystic or was I religious? Right. Or did I believe that there were paths to knowledge other than rational right right and and i said and i said i can't even conceive of that i said i, I said took me aback i said because um it's kind of uh seemed to me obvious that any thinking person would have the highest respect for reason and the rational process and uh have skepticism about anything else yeah the second question she said i want to know what do i think of man huh in the generic sense, sure. include women, obviously. Human and organism. And again, it took me a moment or two to understand what she meant, but she was really t testing me out whether or not I had any version of original sin in my makeup. Exactly. Do, do I see man as sort of intrinsically good right. or intrinsically bad? Right. And I said, I'm not sure that I intrinsically would see him intrinsically either. Yeah. I said, I see him as intrinsically having the potential of both, mm -hmm. but whether or not any individual will actualize more of one than the other is a separate question. Well, she seemed to like that answer. So you passed the first two questions. And the third question was very interesting, too. What do you think? I think it was this. I hope I remember it. I know I have a right in my memoir, but I'm, that was written a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> I hope my memory is correct. I think the first question was either what do you think of the universe or what do you think of life? And what she wanted to know was whether my basic risk feeling about life and existence was affirmative and optimistic or tragic or malevolent. Right. And, of course, the answer was the first of the two. I had a very benevolent, positive sense of the joy of being and the joy of the universe, and I didn't have the feeling that it's in the nature of existence that the cards are stacked hopelessly against we humans. Right. But rather that right. if we can find the right way to live, the universe is 100% for us. Yeah. I hope I'm not being over detailed in my Good Lord, no, no, we're just going to, no, this is, no, God, come on. Um, so when did you meet Barbara? This is a material of drama. I met Barbara about 18 months earlier between high school and college. I worked for a year in, in an uncle's jewelry store to make some money in Winnipeg where I met Barbara. A friend introduced us because... She had this great passion for the Fountainhead, too. Right. So my friend thought we two should meet. And Barbara was also, what, she was maybe 18? Yeah, she yeah. was a year older than me. She was 19. Yeah. And she she came to UCLA, where that's where I came to from. And she was majoring in philosophy. Right. And uh, I brought her with me on my second visit to Rand, and we very quickly became a four-way family. Uh, yeah, exactly. So now you're settling down. You're starting, obviously, to um, work in the circles with Ian and Frank and Barbara. Very soon, now she, well, let me preface this by asking, when you met her, how long had she been working on Atlas Shrugged? Let me see. Now. I'm about, uh, let me think about it, around roughly five or six years. But, and she spent another many years working on it while yeah. you were, yeah. But remember this, Atlas Shrugged is a length of four novels. I uh, understood. Um, but part of the drama was, as the circle's growing, obviously her influence is growing, you had a huge hand in this by basically creating a lecture organization um, that could disseminate these ideas along with your own and yeah. was really responsible for getting the word out um, more well, than that's, anybody else. that's true. How that came about very briefly was that in the interval, we all moved back to New York, and uh, I began to create, in effect, a circle of people who were admirers of the Fountainhead 
and we used to meet at Iron Rands every Saturday night. The most famous member was Alan Greenspan. Right. And uh, we were ended up, all of them, reading out the shrug as it was being written. So Which must have been unbelievably, just ecstatically um, thrilling. I mean... Uh, Ken, there, there, are, there are truly no words. It totally ruined me for a normal social existence. I would I mean, imagine. Even in spite of everything tragic that happened later, which, of course, you know, yeah. uh, th there was an atmosphere of such intellectual passion and intensity. I've talked to several people, one of my sisters. I talked to Albert Greenspan, who has met you know, some of the most famous, brilliant people right. in the world. And I said, did that time ruin you for most human relationships? He smiled and said, yes. Yeah, I can't, I can't imagine. It, I mean, and I don't think, you, you know, um, anything like that could, um, I, it's just so rare. It's hard to imagine what that must have been like. It must have been the equivalent of philosophical cocaine. Yes. Uh, not that I've ever tried cocaine, but just <laughs> an intense rush that you're not going to get anyplace else in life, and, and certainly not in philosophical life. Yes, what, one of the, yes. Anyway, but just to gallop ahead, Ian received a tremendous amount of fan mail for the for the Fountainhead years after it was written. Yeah. And and the publisher said they had never seen anything like this for a novelist to this get this kind of very serious, often very intellectual fan mail. Right. So one night I was thinking about the fact, Jesus, when Atlas Shrugged is published, that's going to ignite an interest in her philosophy far beyond what the Fountainhead right. would do. Wouldn't it be interesting? And there's going to be some desire for a more formal, structured, somewhat more academic way of setting up and explaining what her philosophy was and what its grounds were. And uh, I proposed this idea to Ian that I would create a lecture course. Right. And she was very, very skeptical. She didn't think there would be a market for it because I had no university affiliation. Right. And how would you sell it or even explain? But anyway, the book came out, and there was this great interest. So if anybody lived with any fan mail letter, lived within commuting distance in New York, I wrote them a letter inviting them to take this course. Exactly. And so the first time the course was given, we had 28 students. It was given again uh, six months later. We had 45 students. Then I ha had the idea of running ads for the event in the New York Times, and that's what launched us. Yeah. And then we had up to maybe 150 students. Yeah. At a, at a, now, I used to give the course twice a year. Now, didn't, didn't with Ian's uh, encouragement even, didn't you back then, were you even calling it the Nathaniel Brandon uh, Institute? Well, we called it, the, I call, that's a funny story. You see, I, while, while I had Ian's complete intellectual support, the project was mine, and I didn't want, in case anything wrong happened, for it to reflect on her. Or, yeah. and, and she didn't want that. So, therefore, we didn't want her name. Right. So the lawyer said that to me, well, we have to call this organization something. What will we call it? <laughs> so I said, with you know the marvelous, marvelous ignorance and naivety of youth, I said, I was 28 at the time, just yeah. turned. I said, uh, well, I guess we'll call it the Nathaniel Bradman. It really strikes me as so hysterical in retrospect. But, you know, he, the lawyer kind of looked at me a little quizzically. He says, okay. <laughs> It started out being called before it was incorporated Nathaniel Brandon Lectures, and then a yep. year or two later we changed it to Nathaniel Brandon Institute. And that was really just to, to leave a gap between Brandon and me in case anything went haywire. Well, as anywhere. they say nowadays, she would have plausible deniability. <laughs> <laughs> she, she would come to the question periods, yeah. which was a tremendous draw. Yeah. And then she began having cards inserted in the paperback editions of, of her books, if you want to learn more about this philosophy, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. So when, 10 years later, everything exploded and I cold, closed the Institute, we had uh, people taking the course in 80 cities around the world. Yeah. All of via tape transcription. Just astonishing. And see, you know, one of the things that's so, uh, when a force like Ion kind of comes onto the scene, obviously uh, this is stuff of you know books are written about i mean it was history was being made in many ways and obviously you can analyze and we can talk about it and we have talked about it you can analyze this from a hundred different ways and and see the importance that she had the role that you were playing in this uh, was crucial to that uh, influence uh, the role you had in her even her writing of uh, atlas shrugged was crucial uh, the relationship you had was crucial to the unfolding i mean again you can go at this from a hundred different directions but in certainly a, a 
large part of it was just the force of Ayan's personality. I mean, she's, she's an incredibly charismatic, powerful, strong, clear, brilliant, passionate woman. Yeah. May, may I be allowed to just say a few things about which ideas meant most to me? Of course. At, at this point, at even earlier as a teenager? Sure. Because, because you know, the reason for asking that, having talked to so many admirers of her books, it's almost like different books that different people read because of what they brought sure. to it. At, so I'm picking on what I selected as most important to me. Right. One thing supremely important was the sense of work or a calling as a sacred mission, yeah. a sense of reverence for creative work and a, a sense of mission about one's work. Right. A second thing that I would name very important, of course, the importance of independence and autonomy. Yeah. A third thing that I would mention that indelibly impressed itself down to my molecules was the supreme importance of admiration in romantic love. The yeah. supreme importance of mutual admiration in romantic love. Yeah. Individualism, obviously. Right. A minimalist view of the state, yep. obviously. But at the more personal level, I would name the reverence for work. I would name individualism. I would name autonomy. I would name the importance of admiration in the context of love. Right. Right. Well, given all of that, you... How long did it take for you to fall in love with her? Well, <laughs> uh, I was tempted to say something, and I thought, well, maybe I won't say it. What I was going saying? to say to you, well, as one egomaniac to another. <laughs> you admirate? Well, she had to have a. If anybody had a bigger ego than you, it was her. Uh, wait a minute. I was talking about you and me, not Rand and me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as we both know, <laughs> yeah. ego is another word for Atman, and the bigger the <laughs> ego, right. the only, the, now the problem with ego, you know, the problem is, is ego is not big enough. When it's big enough, it's God. It's stopping halfway short that gets people in trouble. So I think egomaniacs are headed in the right direction. Um, <laughs> well, I, I was meaning only to be humorous. I know, I know. And to I acknowledge know. the fact that uh, there's something uh, healthy and wonderful, I think, about ego but even in its different stages of development, there are sometimes pathological sides, but Absolutely. there are also very positive sides. Absolutely. And I know you would agree. Anyway, back to the ranch. Yeah, you've got I admiration was... for it. You've got, you know, all of these ideas are lined up. Um, your work is kind of aligned with hers in a way that's almost, you know, destiny in terms of calling or mission. And you had a great deal of admiration for her, obviously. So they, well, sort of the pump was prime, thing. wasn't I, it? My marriage to Barbara was a mistake. Yeah. And I knew it. And Rand was not very happy in her own marriage. She had an interesting relationship with Frank. Yes, yeah, he was own. really a lovely man, but quite passive. Yeah. Not, not intellectual. Yeah. V very supportive of her. But it was common, commonly acknowledged that I was able to give I in certain things intellectually, which Frank could not. Right. And it was at times somewhat awkward and embarrassing for me because... Ian could pay me incredible compliments in his presence that made me feel very squirmy. Yeah. And that I felt did not show one of the rare times even then that I was critical of feeling this does not show good judgment. But anyway. Yeah. What happened was that we went from being close friends, everything getting closer and closer, and having these long conversations and, and really feeling like soulmates, to use a cliche. Yeah. And... Uh, I noticed that, you know, like when I would arrive or when I would leave, the hugs, hello or goodbye were getting a little bit longer. And the little physical contact was just getting a little bit more. You're 23, uh, 24? 23, 24. Yeah. I didn't have any idea in my inexperience where the hell this was headed. Yeah. And to the best of my knowledge, she didn't either at that point. Right. Uh, she, anyway, so, um, but the situation was heating up. And uh, she came to an event in Toronto where I'd come from, and we drove back, I and Frank, my sister of mine, and Barbara and me in the car. And in the car, I began doing one of her soliloquies about Nathaniel and about uh, how important he was in her life, and et cetera, and so forth. And then Nathaniel starts doing a soliloquy about how important 
Ayn is in his life, wow. and then Ayn starts doing a soliloquy about, she doesn't know what to call this. It isn't, it's more than friendship, it's family, but it's more than family. Yeah. And she lists a lot of possibilities, and then she suddenly stops and just looks at me, and I stop and just look at her, and made my first fatal mistake. <laughs> I smiled uh -uh. very confidently. Uh-uh. As if I knew exactly what the hell I was doing. Oh, God. I mean, that was definitely ego in the unwise sense. Well, yeah, well, Cal surprise. Anyway, so now we're back in New York, <laughs> and I and phones and says, I need to talk, but you can want to connect him over. So, went over there, and let me say that had this not happened, it never would have occurred to me to take it any further than in that car ride, and then life would continue as usual. Uh, but I had wanted to know what what happened in the car, and what, right. you know, it's one word led to another, and before the conversation was over, we were declaring our love for each other. Wow. And uh, uh, only in retrospect can I realize to what extent she was leading the exchange. I didn't see it as clearly then as I did years later when I could look back when I could look back from the perspective of what was my age right at, at the time when she was doing such and such and knowing that I would not make the moves that she made right. to a person 25 years my junior right anyway um, and that started it and that started it except the, the 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 unusual thing I guess is that passionate believers in honesty and integrity, we have formed our spouses immediately. Right. And invited or requested their permission for us to have a relationship. Right. Which, in a tortured manner of speaking, was granted because Frank felt guilty that for the, all the things he couldn't give I am that he recognized or believed that I could, and Barbara, similarly, for all the things she felt she couldn't give me, but I am could and felt like only the accident of age, that this really was the right woman for Nathaniel, this was really the right uh, man for Ian, except uh, they were born in the wrong time frame, right. with her being 25 years senior, etc. Right. And this lasted, so for about three years, we'd spend an evening and an afternoon a week together. Yep. Unfortunately, I realized not long afterwards that I had made a terrible mistake that I had confused uh, passionate admiration with romantic love. If there was another element involved, I would say it would have been like me at that stage of my development, and maybe at other stages as well, that when I would, the feelings of love would become that intense, I think it would be felt natural for me to sexualize them. Right. And I don't think that's probably that unusual. Yeah. Um, but I realized I'd made a mistake, and I would have given anything not to have started down this road. Yeah. But now I was in it, and uh, I was hearing intoxicating communications about my role and importance. And so here was the the seductiveness of the whole situation. That must have been just imp um, a road almost impossible to get off of, Nathaniel. I mean, here's somebody that you admire, you know, above virtually anybody. She's admired by, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of people. She's this charismatic force. Um, you're part of a philosophical movement. It's extremely rare in any age that you're part of the founding of a philosophical movement, the giddiness, the excitement, the enthusiasm, all of which is appropriate. But then you're also, you're romantically involved with her. And you're a kid. I mean, that, you know, what kind of judgment can you have in some of those early years? So you're obviously even even more inflated than, than you might, might be normally. And then it also fits in a bizarre, wacky way with objectivist philosophy, because Ion, as you know, is sort of the ultimate cognitive therapist that... If you're if you're really being rational, then all of your feelings will follow your rationality. Exactly. And therefore, if you are rationally appreciating Ayn Rand, then the rational thing to do is to be in love with her. And if you're not passionately in love with her, you're not thinking rationally. So absolutely correct, Alas. Woof. Absolutely correct. It was it was really 
I, I'm not trying to alibi or you know or get it, but um, it was uh, it was it was intoxicating, and also uh, also what was important was the fact that I could hardly believe that this person who I had regarded as um, a goddess since the age of 14 yeah. saw me for all practical purposes as the apotheosis of everything she was writing about. Well, and made it very clear that you were the perfect representation of her philosophy, that you were the epitome of it, and that it's no secret that you know you had an enormous influence on um, Atlas Shrugged and, and, and the hero and that and so on. And Atlas Shrugged, I don't have to tell you, is consistently rated as the second most influential book uh, uh, on people's lives after the Bible. That's Library right. of Congress Guess has pointed that out. Guess what number five is? What? Guess what number five? Fountainhead. Is. The Fountainhead. Seven. So, so, so. Yeah, but you yeah. were Atlas. I mean, it's 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 outrageous the kinds of forces that were that were being you know you were being subjected well, to. Well, thank you for thank you for your understanding because sometimes. I myself lose perspective and get very critical of myself of that time. Well, in and a sense, um, obviously, uh, there are an enormous number of factors here, but I really, looking back on it, the number of forces stacked against you were rather awesome, it seems to me. And also, given, um, in a certain sense, you know, you were philosophically battered spouse. Um, because No, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah. I, I know what you mean, and I think it's a very astute comment. Yeah. Um, so this was this took you. I mean, it looks to me that there were probably you know, it would take about four or five crowbars to get you out of that situation. Yes, I want to mention one other thing yeah, that is psychologically do. interesting. Yeah, Ian had an extraordinary gift for seeing whatever was most almost secretively good. What was? Let me omit the word secretively. She had a, a real feeling of seeing something very good, very valuable in the human being that the human being might not be aware of himself or herself. She knew how to bring that out. Uh, that's and great. And the though. significance of that was that it was an enormous gift to their self-esteem. But that was the good news. The bad news was that when the boost comes in that form, the danger is that there is a hook to the person who provided this enlightenment. Yeah. So that to, to retain her goodwill or her admiration becomes very important. Yeah. Uh, I tell you, now, let's say we're talking post-Atlas, I mean the years of that time, I saw quite a number of people, some of them quite famous from different professions, uh, come over to her apartment, sometimes uh, not necessarily fans, but uh, wanted to meet, you know, to talk, and some of them... Uh, Came in like lions and went out like lambs. I mean, you cannot, you cannot imagine. This was another aspect of the intellectual excitement that that seduced me, or that I don't want to say induced me and say intoxicated me, was that she had a gift. You could come in. Let's say you're a chemist. She knows. Let us say nothing about chemistry. You begin to talk. She'll ask you some questions about your profession. I promise you, you'll go home feeling better understood yeah. by her as a chemist than anybody you've ever talked to in your whole life. I bet that's true. And I tell you, it was so thrilling to watch. Yeah. And, um, the well, yeah, yes, we, well, I was saying there was, uh, that, that you were in such a tight box, there were so many reinforcers, so to speak, both positive and negative to keep you in that situation. And again, some of it was wonderful. I mean, this is the, the difficult side and the stuff that it took for you to break out of it, of course, is, you know, well, difficult indeed. But the positives are also extraordinarily positive. I mean, as you say, the intoxication, the excitement, the enthusiasm, and also to be on the very, very positive side. The, the, one can criticize the Ion's philosophy of objectivism and so on all you want. But the fact of the matter is there's some very valuable, if partial, truths in it. And these truths have indeed helped an enormous number of people find their That's own individuality, true. find a certain autonomy from groupthink and the herd mentality. I think it's no accident whatsoever that Atlas Shrugged and the Fountainhead are in the top five books that have changed people's lives. And for you to be a part of the actual construction and creation of Atlas Shrugged, I mean, in a sense, you were you were the, you were part of the. Well, no, she was she was well into the book by the time she met me. You mustn't give me credit where I don't. 
Well, she, I know, I understood, but she gave you credit in terms of being the epitome and the, the perfect manifestation of what she was talking about. So that's, you know, that was her giving you credit. And all of that is a very, you know, that's an extraordinarily giddy thing to be writing. But, but even without the, the intoxicating excitement, the positive things that came out of that whole movement, I think, are positive indeed. And again, they can, you know, they have their limitations, and we can talk about them as partial truths and so on. But that's something that I don't think anybody should take away from any of the people that were involved in, in that movement and its beginnings and its dissemination. I think it's a terrific thing. But then when you get back down on the personal side, then, you know, things are getting pretty tough. And if you look at the, like I say, the emotional side of it, you were hemmed in by, by several forces. And only one of them was, you know, your own egoic stuff. There was positive stuff. There was ions. Basically, it was very, very important, I think, um, to her well-being that you and she were in relationship yeah. and that she saw you as in love with her it sort of fortified uh, all of her notions about rationality and feelings and objectivism. Um, show me your romantic love object, I'm sure she would say, and you, I can show you the person's premises. So obviously if you're thinking rationally and clearly, you're going to be in love with Ayn Rand. And for, for you to break out of that particular box took, like I said, must have taken four or five crowbars well, um, it, it was really, really hard because, uh, on top of which, all my internal conflicts couldn't be entirely concealed, yeah. and that meant that I was, I was being balled out a great deal, in the uh, because I was emotionally remote, detached, right. non-empathic, uh, yeah. preoccupied, the disappeared, the absent-minded professor, you know. Uh, well, now she's in her fifties too. Well, she was yes. By, by this time. Y yes. Yeah. And I was in my 30s. Right. And she was approaching 60. And, uh, but that wasn't the issue. The issue was that I realized that um, I didn't want to be answerable for every breath I took. And it was just... <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the most um, condemning indictments of the philosophy right there. Well, I hope we'll get to that later. Yeah, sure. I'd like a chance to explain <laughs> what I mean. Yeah. Uh, not treated as self-evident. Um, it was like, the interesting thing is she was not wrong in one respect. She sensed that something was wrong that I was not putting out on the table. Yeah. She was not hallucinating. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. Uh, and so to, I would defend her to this extent. It isn't like she was grabbing this stuff off the wall. Her perceptions were correct. Well, they usually were. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you say she's that, a that's damn the, perceptive. That's the maddening part. Yeah. In any event, uh, she was in the, the relationship, the romance, so to speak, came to an end not long after Atlas was published, not because of a fight, but simply because she had went into a quite deep depression, and it, her mind wasn't there, and we, we became friends again. And then when I was before, now, after she no, well that was she didn't. That's before she found out about Patricia. That, yeah, that happened later. But yeah, uh, uh, but I'm talking about in the late '60s. Right. Pardon me, in, in the yeah, in the earlier '60s. And um, well, I didn't mean to interrupt there. She had gone into a depression. What what happened there, Nathaniel? She had tried to prepare her publishers that the attacks on her were going to be like nothing they could imagine. Yeah. And everybody was so enthusiastic about the book, they'd never believed her. She, she knew, but she also hoped or expected there would be some serious intellectual minds speaking up in her defense. There really weren't, were there? No. Strangely enough, that's a whole s separate story. Yeah, I know, but it's, it's one that's perplexed you and her followers no end. Maybe we can come back to it, but go ahead anyway. There was, yeah, there... It's, it's, yeah it's, it's a very interesting s phenomena, and for me... It was, it was, it was, it was like a trauma. Yeah. Because we, I would be in an event where I, I would be, let us say, lecturing or doing something, or Ryan would be there, and then I would read maybe a few weeks later in Newsweek or someplace a, re, a, a report of what had taken place at that event, which bore no relationship to what had taken place at that event. And uh, this, today we're more cynical, we're wiser about the press, but this is going back thirty years. 40 years. Right. And uh, I, I couldn't believe some of the stuff 
that would be alleged about her or about me or yep. about the book or about what ideas we were advocating. Yep. Usually pretty much the opposite of what she meant. It was, it was uh, here was the most consistent and passionate spokesperson for individual rights I have any personal knowledge of on this planet. Right. I don't know anybody right. who was more consistent in the politically consistent perspective that she had on individual sovereignty and the very limited role for the state, as you, right. of course, know. Anyway, I remember... So she was getting savage. ...in the New York Times what they were calling, you know, good literature. And I, I used to... I was always interested in what people thought was good, if this is what they thought was bad. <laughs> and and uh, I was kind of appalled by the dreck, by my standards. And I, I remember I gave myself the assignment... Each Sunday, I must read the entire book review section of the New York Times until I can do so in a state of complete indifferent equanimity, and I'll stop. <laughs> Desensitization at its finest. Well, there you have it. You understand? It's just my way of trying to communicate to you. It was really a very hard period, kidding aside. It was and very hard. she was going through that. Even though she knew it was going to happen, the slings and arrows of that kind of outrageous fortune are hard to bear. And you see, and you see, you see, I had one relief. I had something I could do about it. I had NBI and, and, and the lecture course, etc., which kept attracting more and more people. And, uh, and the books were selling fabulously. The, the sales of the books are incredible to this day. I know. And the Fountain had published in 1943 still sells in excess of 100,000 copies a year. Atlas published in 57 sells in excess of 100,000 a year. I mean, it's, it's mind-boggling. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so she the situation was, was deteriorating both maritally right. and uh, with iron. I'm obviously leaving out a great deal because otherwise this would be a 12-hour marathon. We'd only cover... This relationship. Well, we're anyway. gonna we'll, we'll have we'll have three conversations covering the three three different periods. We can just ramble about this one as long as you want. I, I'm yours to command. There we <laughs> Let's do pause briefly though on on her reception because it has puzzled a lot of people. And uh, let me just give you a few of my own thoughts on it, and then we can sort of knock it back and forth a little bit. Because if nothing else, if you look at the actual impact that she's had on people's lives and certainly the clarity and consistency and power of her thinking. It, at first glance, appears somewhat odd that professional philosophers didn't respond to her. Not that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, not in a novel. No, no, no. If you choose to express your philosophy in a novel, I can understand why that would stop a lot of professional philosophers. I, I was talking about public intellectuals in a somewhat different sense, but for... I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, but nonetheless, people, there, there has been a consistent curiosity about, about how she was never particularly taken seriously by right. either of those groups. Right? Yes. Right. That's all, we're, that's all I'm saying. I mean, it, and so uh, it, that's always been kind of a puzzle, certainly to her followers, and I think even to, well, you know, bystanders, sociologists looking at the movement. But there, there are a couple of, you know, points about that, obviously. Um, one, certainly on just public intellectuals, is that she was clearly swimming upstream in an age of collectivism and uh, socialism as sort of avant-garde and chic, um, quite beyond um, you know, anything that, that, that it merited. And for her to come in, and obviously coming out of uh, collectivist society herself and seeing the devastation it can cause is certainly one of the emotional drivers that, that That's she... That's right. Yeah. Philosophy nowadays ain't what it used to be. In other words, as you know, most academic philosophy is just trivial, arcane. Um, it's removed from all the actual concerns of human beings. Basically so. It has pretty much nothing to do with anything. And, and I, I understand how it got that way, but it doesn't excuse it. So a professional philosopher would, would look at something like Ion and say, you know, it was never the case that she was a Nietzschean. It was never the case that she was this. But there are sort of elements, if you will. Of you course. can find some of Nietzsche's ideas in Ion, the uh, attack I on agree. the herd mentality, for example. Oh, but yeah. she wasn't a Nietzschean. And you can find elements of Immanuel Kant in her, of the emphasis on autonomy and rationality being its own judge, for example. But she wasn't a Kantian. She sort of wasn't very fond of Kant. And you can sort of go down the line like that. A professional philosopher can isolate himself from Ion 
by simply pointing out that there's, oh, quote, nothing original. But I think that misses the point in many, many ways. And let me just give you my, my sort of overview on, on the type of philosopher that, that Ion was. To me, she was much closer to somebody like a Schopenhauer. And I'll tell you why. If you actually look at Schopenhauer's works, the same criticisms could be and were labeled at him as were labeled at Ion. Now, I'm not saying that he and, and Ion shared similar ideas. They, not, not, not too many similar ideas there. But their reception was similar. Um, in that people said, well, there's nothing really new or novel in Schopenhauer. And actually, there really isn't in terms of he made some interesting contributions to Immanuel Kant's notion of a priori and so on. He's a very bright boy. But his contribution was much different. He's still the number one selling philosopher in the German language. It was an entirely different, it was a capacity to move people, it was a capacity to take very important ideas, draw them out, contribute to them in, in some novel ways, but to actually sort of make a statement, a historical statement, be at the right place at the right time, and really move countless people with these ideas. There's a passion about his ideas, and his writing was just exquisite. So he personally didn't have the charisma that Ion did, so uh, he would never you know, be part of um, an exhilarating or intoxicating human movement as, as Ion and you were. But nonetheless, I, I, I find it very interesting that the same kinds of criticisms w were labeled. So you yeah, hear the same thing from professional philosophers that, you know, Ayn wasn't necessarily original on this, that, or the other. I think it sort of misses the point. But it also points out just how pointless academic philosophers are. May I add just one sure. to what you're saying? Uh, I agree with what you're saying, and I would only add this. I think that a key to understanding what was good about her with, in the context of what you are talking about now is that she was striving to present an integrated vision of man's life on earth and what its well-being required. Right. And what was very interesting was the way in which she related different philosophical issues in the service of that vision. Right. Now, that's exactly what modern philosophy doesn't like. Yeah, tell me about it. Well, you ought to know. Well, it's just, it's a mess. It's a mess. But I, so let's, so we, you know, we sort of shake our heads at the poor professional philosophers, but it's, the public intellectuals also, I mean, they swarm down on her, and I think there, it was, it really, again, we can think of many reasons, but I think you hit a real central one, which was that the collectivism was still, you know, it was radical chic. It was leftist chic. And, boy, she was almost a one-person anti-collectivist force. And it must have found her very threatening, because she was a very popular personality. She was a TV personality. People, lo as you say, she's just a charismatic bomb, so to speak. And it was sort of like iron in one pan, and the collectivist radical chic herd mentality in the other pan. And it was about an even match. Well, yes, and you're absolutely right. This has many ramifications, this issue that you've raised now, which we'll probably talk more about later. Sure. Uh, uh, but very, very briefly, most professional intellectuals were raised in a somewhat, or participated in a predominantly leftist or collectivist vision of the good society. Right. Parenthetically, this is one of the reasons, in my judgment, why there has been, while there's been a tremendous amount of scholarship about the Hitler's regime in Germany, there has been a minuscule comparable scholarship for the horrors of either uh, the Soviet Union yeah. or Communist China or even Cambodia. Yeah. And the point there is this, what all of these different countries and System 7 communists they are all different schools advocating versions of socialism or tribalism or collectivism. And their major contribution to the human race was in the 20th century, uh, we are now coming to understand, they are responsible in the names of their socialist ideals for the torture and or murder of roughly 100 million human beings. So now look at the dilemma that puts you in. Yeah. If you're a professor at Harvard University who's had nothing but glowing things to say about the Soviet Union, yep. you've got a hell of a dilemma. <clears throat> From John Paul Sartre on. All of the, all of the uh, existential leftists were in bed with that vision. And however idealistic it was, it was fundamentally misplaced. And, uh, but nonetheless, that's the, that's the 
stream, you're swimming up. May I ask you this question? Yeah. If genuine idealism was their motivation, what do you think it would have taken for them to begin to question perhaps the most fundamental underlying ideal, namely that the individual belonged to the collective? How many, if 100 million deaths is not enough, how many would there have to be before somebody would say, hey, wait a minute, let well, us check our premises? Ex well, exactly. But what's required, of course, is, as you know, in these cases, is a clear and evident path from the premise to the result. And that's what they are, intellectuals are very good at not seeing the obvious when it comes to that. Yes. And so that's, I think, one of the reasons that Ion was so threatening. Because, look, if she, was, if she was the same passionate voice, but what she was saying was wrong, they wouldn't, they'd ignore her. They well, hated that's, her. That's true. They hated her. They went out, and that, that tells you that she was stepping a little bit too close to home. She was stepping on some raw nerves. She was stepping on some exposed premises. And again, you don't have to defend everything Ian said to see that she was essentially onto an important truth in this regard. And I think that's why she was met with a, you know, they do protesteth too much. I mean, they just went bloody ballistic over this thing, exactly. way out of proportion. And that's because basically they were, you know, they were, they were treading on thin ice. And I don't find it necessary to, you know, deny all of their idealism. I mean, people can have some pretty idealistic I'm things, not, get pretty I'm not, bent. I'm not denying all of it either, you know, but I'm trying to make a point. I hear you. That I do think that intellectual conscientiousness at some point has to count for something. Well, I think it's just, you know, I remember what happened in the, in the 1950s when they were looking at smoking and lung cancer. <laughs> there were doctors on the back of Life magazine doing advertisements for Camel cigarettes. Because really? it, when the, the evidence was still, you know, quote, a little tenuous. And so the, obviously there were doctors that, that were going to appear and say, no, it's not harmful for you at all. And that's my fondest memories growing up are doctors smoking cigarettes on TV telling you how healthy they are. And that's... That it, but sooner or later it became impossible to deny the fact that there is a causal linkage between smoking and lung cancer. And sooner or later you find out there's a causal linkage between herd mentality and collectivist barbarism. That wasn't necessarily clear at the beginning. And then when it w did become clear, it was, to me, TV doctors smoking. It was this whole, and that's what so many of the public intellectuals were. They were, they were, <laughs> they were philosophical doctors smoking and saying it didn't harm you. And, but somewhere in the back of their eyes, you could see that even they were starting to doubt it. And I think that's why Ion completely infuriated them. I used to say to Ian, when she would sometimes be agitated over this, I say, look, Ian, you can't have it both ways. You can't, on the one hand, want to maintain that you are a pioneer who is carving out new territory, and on the other hand, insist that any person with half a brain would have to agree with you. <laughs> I said, yeah. and she'd laugh, and she'd say, you got me, you know. <laughs> I see, you know, either, either we are asking people something which is really hard to step outside of the context that they took in with their mother's milk for all practical purposes. Yep. Yep. And that has to be factored in to how you look at all this. One reason for saying that, incidentally, aside from the fact that it's true, many of the ideas that she propounded in the 50s and 60s when Atlas Drug was still being argued about seem much less shocking and far more palatable and are better understood by people today than they were for 30 or 40 years ago. Yeah. Meaning, uh, in terms of a lot of the issue, we are, ever since Vietnam, we are much more suspicious of uh, authority, of what the state may or may not order us to do. Right. That there's been a lot of changes uh, with regard to authority, with regard to our view of the government, that... Uh, it's a different world. It's it? a different world, and on both sides of the street, you know, and, that, and I think that's what got everybody really looking at it carefully. I mean, certainly the American uh, uh, government, but it, it went all the way back to finding out that Stalin himself had starved 13 million Ukrainians to death, that it might have reached 80 million deaths, some total, um, counting the gulag. Uh, from Hitler to Stalin to Pol Pot, I mean, it, it's the, the collectivist nightmare often parading under idealist uh, images. That, that's well, sort of one of the real scary the things we've learned from this century. Exactly. 
And exactly. Yeah, and so, so that so, all of a sudden, though, now we know smoking causes lung cancer, and everybody they, they don't people don't get too crazy when you say smoking causes lung cancer. Now they kind of go, yeah, I know, hard lesson, huh? So this is the environment, this is the world, and then it's 1961. I'm 31 years of age. She's depressed. She's depressed. My relationship with Barbara is really like a, a friend in a desperate, miserable situation, but not husband and wife. Yeah. And in, it's the first night of the new, basic principles of objectivism. I'm up on the platform. I begin to talk, and then my eyes fall on this beautiful, blonde girl in the third row who is looking at me with a look of rapture on her face. And I'm like walking into a dream. Patricia. And um, she's 21 years of age, newly arrived from from, uh, Mount Shasta or or Palo Alto. And uh, she's read Atlas Shrugged in the Fountainhead, and she comes now to take this course. And uh, we'd have conversations. I had no idea where this was heading uh, either. Uh, I, I guess I don't sound very bright. I didn't know where I was heading, and I didn't know where this was heading. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm beginning to yeah. sound a little dense to myself. <laughs> in any event, in any event, um, you must realize this. Even though I'd had this double relationship, I was still a very, in certain ways, puritanical, faithful, monogamous, believing husband. I, I, you know, I really was committed to monogamy. I was like a metaphysical exception. I <laughs> I understand. Well, also, it's sort of an occupational um, hazard of the male human organism that we don't pick up the, quite as many emotional cues as the women do. So well, we kind of a little bit blinkered on some of these things. Isn't altogether surprising. Yes, this, it's all true. But in any event, she assumed, you know, I'd introduced Barbara, and from my manner, she concluded that I was a happily married man. She told me this later afterwards, obviously. And so she decided, in effect, uh, I will have to remain in her mind like an abstraction of what she was in love with, but it's not going to be me. <laughs> Later, she was to meet and marry a very nice man who was also a student in my course, and we were invited to their wedding. And I and Ren and her husband were invited to their wedding. Now picture me in the church, and on one side of me is Barbara, and the other side of me is, is Ian. Right. And walking down the aisle with her father is Patricia. <laughs> and in that moment, Everything inside me starts screaming, I do not like this. And although I didn't know it until later, she was having the same experience in that moment that she's just about to make a colossal mistake. So I am really shook up. Afterwards, there's like a party at a restaurant, and uh, I keep going outside to breathe fresh air. I can't, you know, I feel like I'm losing my mind in there. Yeah. And... uh, Patricia keeps looking through the crowd, where's Nathaniel, where's Nathaniel, where's Nathaniel, you know. And uh, off they go on their honeymoon. God. For three years, uh, I just tried to put all that aside and uh, get on with my life. But um, Were you still sort of in love? With Patricia? Yeah. I wouldn't have said it yet, no. Yeah. I, okay. would, I wouldn't have permitted myself the thought. Yeah, looking back on it, were you? I'm reluctant to say you're in love when you don't really know the person. Okay, that's fair enough. You but know, something, sure. something had gotten, some chime had gotten it wrong. Was in, there, there was an incredible, I want to pick my words, I intend the words I'm going to use. There was an incredible spiritual slash sexual attraction. Understood. It, there, there was something... To this day, I don't fully understand, but I know I want to use the word spiritual, not psychological. Well, and they talk about potential and actual energy. Maybe there was a, there's a potential and actual love, and, and y'all had a spark of real potential love. Yeah, here's what I think. Here's what I would think. I hope this comes across the way I mean it. She projected somebody who lived in an ecstatic state of consciousness. Yeah. I felt that I did. Yeah. And if I would say that was what we were recognizing each other and picked up off each other, and that's what drew us together. So we would talk during these years, you know, and kid around and everything. But uh, give you an idea how, how oblivious I was. 
they they became friends with other friends of mine, and her her husband's name was Larry. They came to a party. Now picture this: I and Rand is there with her husband Frank, Barbara's there, etc. And Bar- Patricia and Larry come in, and and Patricia says something, gets talking, and she says, "Oh, Nathaniel Brandon is the second most rational man I know." <laughs> so I must have had a look at my face, and she, and she said, "Well." I don't know him well enough to judge. I, na- I named my husband first because I know him and I live with him. <laughs> and then I don't know what look was on my face, but she began to laugh. She said, will you look at this look on his face? <laughs> he, he doesn't like this. He wants to be first with <laughs> any woman. Now, remember this. <laughs> this child of 21, I lived in a world where everybody... Um, all my contemporaries were somewhat afraid of me. Do you understand me? Oh, yeah. Nobody in my group, except Diana, which is different, would ever have made a statement of this kind to me. Yeah. And so when I made some flippant answer, instead of meeting her more head-on, she said, oh, my God. She said, I think Nathaniel Brandon lacks courage. Uh, I think it might have been in that moment that I fell in love. Ah. Uh, I went into the other room. I said, Barbara, I must tell you something hilarious. Can you believe it? Patricia just told me. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Good move. I have a feeling that anyone listening to this conversation will say, if I ever suspected that Nathaniel Brandon doesn't play with a full deck, surely this interview confirms it. And and clearly he hasn't been playing with a full deck for quite some time. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. It's great to be alive. So, <laughs> so when did you, well, you and Patricia ended up together? We ended up after three years of torture. Uh, it came to a climax. Was I was out going somewhere one day. I met her. She was, by the way, she was earning her living as a model. She was raising money so she can go back to college. Right. And I met her on the street one day, and wherever she was, she always had a book with her. And so we got talking about whatever she was reading. I can't remember what it was now. And we were having great fun standing on Madison Avenue talking. And I said to her, if you ever want to come by my office for a visit and say hello, chat a bit, feel free to drop in. So uh, a week or two later, I think it was a week later, she came by uh, my office. And we had an incredible two- or three-hour conversation. And now I was really, now I was beginning to feel so smitten. Yeah. Uh, um, (laughs) You're in deep smit. I I can't, I can't... uh, I wrote about this in, in the memoir of my years with Ayn Rand, and I, yep. if anybody's interested, they could read it there, but it, it was just... Um, and then you end up romantically and, and, involved. And, and, and I couldn't I couldn't tell her about Ayn. That wasn't my secret to share. I know, but Ayn did find out. Oh, yeah, I mean, but tell I, I know, I mean, tell Patricia about my relationship oh, with Ayn. Oh, of course. Well, that was still officially secret. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, but Patricia had guessed it just by watching us together. Yeah. Uh, which I later learned quite a few people had. Yeah. We were nowhere as clever at concealment yeah. as we imagined. <laughs> or as they say in Afghanistan, people are not stupid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in any event, uh, eventually, Ian gets told that Nathaniel is in love with his 21-year-old model. All hell breaks loose. Yeah. Uh, Ian f- feels devastated. She feels uh, like I'm the traitor to all of my professed values, I'm a hypocrite, I'm a liar, and she is going to erase me from the world professionally. You know, pause right there, though, you, and I know you know this, but can you imagine how devastating that would be to her? Obviously you can, but I mean, all of the things that we talked about that were in place that sort of acted to, to keep you on that road were also of in place course. to keep her on her road. Of course. I mean, if course. you were the embodiment of rational objectivist philosophy, then you couldn't but love her romantically. And if you didn't love her romantically, you couldn't be an objectivist. It just didn't compute. Well, no, she wouldn't say that. No, she wouldn't say. Just to correct you, she wouldn't say that any person who professed an admiration for her, her philosophy or agreement with it, quote, should be in love with her. But she meant a man of my stature. And There's no way around it. That, that's, no, no, I was very careful when I phrased it. If the epitome of her philosophy was being rational right and had that, that admiration for Ion, then he should romantically be in love with Ion. You could read it off his premises. 
And if he didn't, the whole structure was threatened. I mean, that's certainly how emotionally how it must have hit her. And not and in addition to how it must have hit her just as, as a woman. I mean, obviously there's there are doubts about her own attractiveness as she's pushing, you know, in sixties and and she's still so she's very much now. Yeah, well, and she's she very much in love with woman. you and, and also on every level, you know, physical, emotional rational and spiritual whether she would call it that or not this was a kick in the in the teeth you know and i don't I mean again i don't have to tell you anything but i, well, I was just sort of uh, in support of what you're saying whenever i would think about telling her and i would discuss this with barbara who i had told the truth to we both felt this will kill i mean we didn't know what the hell was the right thing i lost all sense of what is the right thing to do because in this case the objectivist precept was correct, and I was wrong, which is tell the fucking truth. Yeah, yeah. But I felt guilt. Yeah. I, I felt I knew this was going to be a catastrophe. Yeah. I knew that it was the end not just of Ian and me personally, but the end of the work I was doing. Yeah. And uh, we did close the Institute, and I moved to California with Patricia and began a new life. Yeah. And began the the reevaluation or the rethinking about what the uh, past 18 years of my life had been about because I've just covered with you now a span of 18 years of my life. Yep. Um, from 1950 to 1968? 1968 yep. when uh, I then published the denunciation of me and Barbara, Barbara for taking my side, etc. In the objectivist publication, we having had the foresight to get a complete mailing list of our subscribers, wrote and sent out our response, etc. And then the world divided into three sides. Those who stood with Ian against Brandon, those who stood with Brandon against Ian, those who said it's not for us to have an opinion on this subject one way or the other, it's none of our business. Yeah. And uh, that's the way it played out. And uh, But what I'm sort of jumping over here was that after uh, Barbara had broken with Ian because she could see that uh, Ian was really hell-bent on destroying me. Yeah. Uh, she had arranged for me to, a, pub, a particular publisher was going to publish The Psychology of Self-Esteem. Right. It was almost finished. Ian was going to try to sabotage that, which she did. It was subsequently published elsewhere and did had a very good life, but she tried to prevent it. Yep. And uh, doing things that Barbara thought were morally outrageous and that threw her over into my camp, as it were. Yeah. So I was keenly aware of what you're saying on how many different levels I was going to be wounding her. And I was going to be wounding her philosophically, and I was going to be wounding her as a woman. Yeah. And I knew that. Yeah. And it was also, Nathaniel, if I could briefly interrupt it, it also was, I mean, some people might think that if, if you and Barbara are saying, look, if you tell I and this, it will kill her, that it's sort of somehow overblowing or, or being narcissistic in the bad sense. And I, I think that's a misreading of it. I think that it, in a sense, well, it almost did kill her. But in part, of course, because what you two had together, but in part, it was also the elaborate framework that she had built around the rational objectivist worldview that amplified the effects enormously. Yes. Because again, a, it wasn't just a man leaving a woman; it was a threat to the entire objectivist framework. It just—it it, it was almost inconceivable that this kind of thing could happen, given her yes. premises. Although I would have denied this in the years early of this period, you know, earlier in my life, it is very clear to me, and I wrote about it in the memoir and elsewhere that. There was an unacknowledged or unadmitted bias against emotions right. in that world. And, of course, whenever that happens, in the end, it's emotions that are your undoing. All the disowned feelings that Rand and or I brushed under the floor of the subconscious right. came out in the worst possible way right. because we didn't allow them to come out in the normal, healthy way. Right. Could I amend that? Would you agree with this, that it wasn't so much emotions that were denied as emotions that didn't follow your rational view? In other words, if you got very excited about Ian's book, that's allowed. That's rational. But if there yes, were emotions that... Emotions that didn't fit my right. intellectual commitments. That's right. That's right. I'm sorry. Thank you for the clarification. You got it. Yeah, that's right. Emotions that didn't fit yeah. my, my commitments intellectually. Yeah. And, of course, your emotions with Patricia did not fit that commitment, and therefore the walls came tumbling down. And, yes, and uh, so that's really uh, 
the end of Act One, as it were. It, it uh, is indeed. It's, it's not the end of the Ayn Rand story, strangely enough. Nor am I suggesting I stop at this moment, but I am just saying that. Exactly. No, it goes on. Um, in Devers had connections with Ion, for example. That is such a dramatic story. I mean, yeah. <laughs> incredible. Well, the Devers, the whole Devers story is incredible. Well, all of them. I swear to God, Nathaniel, you are just a, yeah, oh, you are just a. You know, several movies of the week and one grand <laughs> epics all rolled into one. It's just unbelievable. But but let's just let's just pause briefly and we're we're gonna you know because we're circling back through these Ion will come in and out of the story all, all the way up obviously in, in, until um, well actually all the way up to today but certainly until her death in 1982 but here it is now it's 1968 69 um, and there's a parting of the ways so to speak and obviously it's, it has to be very very difficult on you but you're also going through what I think is in some ways you know, one of the most mature periods of your own thinking and because it was both working with um, some of the rational objectivist tenets, but even in the psychology of self-esteem, you had arrived at a lot of those ideas independently of Ion. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and hell yeah. Absolutely. So, I mean, the two concepts of efficacy and self-worth, for example, this is completely independently um, arrived at by, well, by it's, you. It's, I would think more, I mean... Ian used to say, and unfortunately I didn't take her seriously enough, she, she would say to me, I don't really know very much, or I know nothing about psychology. I'm going to leave that to you, Nathaniel. Right. And, of course, later when we get to areas of my disagreements, the major area of my disagreement, directly or indirectly, will fall within the, the, the domain of psychology. Yeah, I, I, I have, agree. I have disagreements outside that, but yeah. the greatest number of uh, right. issues... Even start, even they may have just started out as psychological issues. Then later on, I saw there's also wider philosophical ramifications. Right. Right. So, so here it is. It's it's you're, you're it's 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 you're entering the 1970s, and like I say, I think one of the real mature, um, strong periods of of your own work, certainly in not solely, but but particularly strongly in in the field of psychology. And but at the same time, it's set in both the positive things that you had taken from the previous 20 years and that you had learned, but it also must be set in a context of, you know, something was a little bit off with, with, with that general worldview. As you say, part of it is just too rational in the sense that things that don't fit with the rationally sanctioned view, then those tend to get shoved under the carpet. And so it, you're allowed to have almost anything, and you can have strong emotions and so on, but they do have to fit within your intellectual commitments, and everything that doesn't is kind of screened out. It doesn't really go away, but is sort of put under the rug or over the rug, however you want to look at it, and causes problems. And so looking back on it, how would you sort of, you know, give a Reader's Digest overview of, of what some of the, criticism that you started to have about that general approach? Well, let me come into it from this angle. I don't know if you remember who Chaim Gannat was, the late great child psychologist who, who wrote brilliant, I still regard them as the best books ever written on how to raise psychologically healthy children. He and I became friends. He died when he was young, only 52. Yeah. And I met him a few years earlier at an APA convention. Yeah. And we, we became friends. And he was out in California lecturing. And I was walking with him to the place where he was going to give his lecture. I don't know how we got into it, but he happened to make the remark that all of the major mistakes in his life that he'd made, he made when he was neglecting something he was feeling. Ah. Uh. And I stopped dead because I realized I could have made the same statement. Wow. And that really started me or galvanized me into thinking much more deeply yeah. about the relationship of reason and emotion. What year was that? 1970. Okay, so that's two, that's two years after you. But so you really are in a period of rethinking the yeah, whole... Yeah, I left there October 68. Yeah. So it's like a year and two months. Yeah. Anyway, so that so I began to think about a lot about what were the danger signals to which I had made myself oblivious. And that got me into thinking far more deeply about emotions, not that they are suddenly purveyors of absolute truth. They have to be evaluated in a, in a context integrated with other considerations, but they are potentially 
invaluable sources of information right. about what's happening in oneself. Right. And that started me down the road, and that culminated in a book which I really wrote in part to make issues clearer to myself, but in part for my old students to undo any harm that I had done in terms of my own unintentional uh, encouragement of uh, emotional repression. So I wrote a book called The Disowned Self. Yeah. And, the, and that was really like a written in, I didn't raise the issue of objectivism in the book, but it was really written for my students. It was like an act of contrition or undoing, trying to, whatever harm I might have caused by participating in in a in a really inappropriate perspective on the relationship of reason and emotion. Right. It's uh, a terrific book, too. Still is. Well, thank you. Uh, it, it was, I guess all of my books, in one respect or another, are my effort to make something a little clearer to myself. But I, my, my conscious intention was to offer this to my students. I think that's why most of the main ones from the psychology of self-esteem on forward still have enduring value. Yeah, at which yeah, I'm sort of, yeah, I'm sort of... Uh, stunned, uh, and you know what's very interesting? For many people, relatively speaking, I've al I've always striven to, str to write in the a literary style which is accessible to the educated layman. You know, yep. I've I try to avoid sounding like a psychologist. Yep. I like you know the way Le Eric Fromm or, or Karen Horn and I wrote in terms of if you're an educated person, yep. you don't have to have a university degree to understand this. Okay. Yep. But the interesting thing was the book, which in some ways is more technical than my later books, The Psychology of Self-Esteem, remains for many of my readers their favorite book. Yeah, no. And that in, it intrigues me because that kind of, it's, it's in structure and its way of thinking, the philosophy that's in, underneath the psychology is spelled out very explicitly, I guess. And so it kind of is the structure that even later, with all the things I would say differently, has a certain validity. I think that's not uncommon. I know a lot of writers from Alan Watts to yourself, frankly to myself, that some of their early books are still some of their most popular and best-selling ones. For me, it's no boundary. And I think the reason is that, even though I would also say some things differently about no boundary, I think the truths that we latch on to are enduring truths. And the, they're expressed at a time when we're just getting the hang of it ourselves, and therefore, it really speaks to people who are just getting the hang of it themselves, too. And it's some That's of the right. things that we sort of take for granted now. We didn't take for granted in the earlier books, and therefore, we had to walk people through it in a way that we wouldn't even think of walking them through it today, perhaps. You're, because it's you're so absolutely obvious. right. And, and No Boundaries is the perfect example of, yes. yes I think that's yes. exactly right. And, and for that reason, I, and so I'm really glad that that happens. And that's why I'm very reluctant to go back and tinker with a lot of those things. Because I'm not sure we know what we're tinkering with. It, that was I was asked if I wanted to for the new new publication that came out of the 32nd anniversary edition of the Psychology of Self Esteem. When I was asked, did I want to edit it and update it? And I was afraid to. Yeah. No, I, I very wise well, I judgment. I understand perfectly what you've just said. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you started. So this was 1970, and this and the gentleman said everything that he every time he'd gotten in trouble is when he had not paid no, attention to something. He, he, he said the times he thought of the times in his life where he made the wrong choice. A, he couldn't think of an exception. He was always ignoring something important that he was feeling. Right. And the point was not that you then follow your feelings blindly, but that you do give your feelings a legitimate voice, at the, a place at the table yeah. for the discussion. Yeah. In any event, um, sometime in the 1970s, uh, this is jumping ahead a bit, just to entertain you personally. <laughs> sometime in the 1970s, I was reassessing everything and rethinking everything. So one of the issues I came up against was the whole subject of mysticism. Yeah. And I had a moment of illumination, which was the following. I don't really know anything about mysticism. <laughs> uh, I don't know, I don't think that I had read anything on that subject, but yeah. I know I am really quite ignorant. And if I'm taking a philosophical position on the subject of mysticism, I think the first step should be for me to find out what it is. <laughs> so that started me reading. Okay? Yeah. And the years went by, and I was still in the very early stages of my explorations. That really belongs in part three. But <laughs> in the early 1980s, I wrote a book, and in it, I had a chapter 
Beyond Self-Esteem. The book was called Honoring the Self, and the last chapter was called Self-Esteem and Beyond, or something like that. Right. And I decided that I wanted to look at the whole issue of transpersonal psychology, as it was then called. Right. But I wanted to be really, really certain that I understood exactly what it was I was going to, in some cases, agree with, but in other cases, disagree with. So I began asking around, who is the most reliable, non-fluffy person <laughs> who can really correct me if I'm on the wrong track, who, or who can advise me, what's what about transpersonal psychology? And the unanimous voice that came back to me was, find Ken Wilbur. <laughs> Ken Wilbur is the man. And that is how it all began. We met in uh, your hotel room at the Four Seasons, was it? In San, San Francisco, I think yeah. it was. And I asked you when this book, would, would you read the chapter if anything in it is wrong, or, the, you know, factually, you know. And you were very helpful. You even were generous enough to give a nice quote to my publisher for the book. But that was the beginning of my getting interested about that dimension of experience. <laughs> Yeah, and About we'll come back to that because I've yeah it's it's been it's a it's been a wild and fun sort of dialectic that we've had together. And again, I say that one of the main things like, we've just always enjoyed hanging out with each other, and and it's there's just a certain spark that is really fun to share with you. And and we I I remember that meeting in the hotel room that was oh, like 1983. I, I remember this with great exhilaration. I've i I totally find you the most intellectually stem stimulating, challenging, fun person to talk with. It's great. It's great. I'm mean, serious. I love you. Oh, I think, I'm <laughs> I with really you all the way. I admire you enormously. I think you're very, very clever. I think you're very hilariously funny. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that's all there is to that. There it is. So this is, that was, we met in, I believe, 1983. That's right. Right, because I was Absolutely staying with Roger correct. and Francis. In Tiburon, and That's but right. this is we're back now to 1970, and this is you're giving kind of the end point of your expansion beyond, you know, I would say transcend and include the rational objectives. In yes. other words, you really didn't deny the important aspects of it. There's some damned important aspects of it, no, but you were finding some... things that didn't get included in it, and you were expanding exactly. Your own scope. And I'll have much more to say about that in part it, two and part three. Exactly. But exactly. I couldn't resist the temptation to just run a decade or so ahead. Yeah, so you're 1970 now, and, and sort of take us back to when you would write, for example, um, you know, the disowned self and some of the stuff that you're starting to realize that you had, in fact, disowned back then. That's right. Yeah. And so that, there was two things happening inseparably. One was rethinking a philosophy to which I committed myself, but also as deep as I could go, self-examination. Yeah. Why, what had permitted me to make the mistakes I made? And, uh, wow. And so, it, in fact, in, the two were very closely linked, the self-examination and the philosophical examination. Sure. And for obvious reasons. And, um... That can't have been an easy period. Well, it was hard because of several things. You must realize something going back a bit I began a thought but I got distracted and I forgot it going back to when everything exploded in New York and I knew that I was being vilified and lied about in incredible ways uh, and I was sort of only thinking Patricia and I will go leave town we're going to California start new life to hell with all this stuff and Barbara said Nathaniel you've got to fight back you've got to get it through your head that I and wants you dead yeah and for me, that was a trauma to get it that, that notwithstanding everything that had happened, I was slow to realize the seriousness of her, the position which she had fallen right. into or stepped into. Right. So, plus but she, of course, viewed as self-defense, didn't she? Uh, yes, plus the fact that my best and my closest friends, of course, uh, in my circle, all sided, of course, with... Uh, now, these were people who had been professing love, worship, yeah. I'd saved their life, I gave them their future. I mean, right. I, I lived in a sea where I was treated like a demigod, but more importantly, where these people were always talking about what they learned from me, what they gained from me, what a life I'd helped them, blah, blah, blah. And the fact that once the explosion happened, they wouldn't even talk to me because I knew why. They were afraid, suppose I reached them, and they began to feel moved, and maybe they weren't prepared to take Ian's totally gospel truth. What problems would that create? Wow. So there was a lot 
of warfare going on. I eventually, I have to start answering accusations and dealing with that stuff. And uh, it's revolted me. And uh, it's just was never my view of what life is about. Right. So it was very, very hard. And also, given given the force that Ion was, you can imagine the force she brought to bear down upon your proposed death. But you see, yes, I knew in her naivete, she thought that if she sends out to her, our people, the mailing list, you know, that we have now, etc., an annunciation of Nathaniel Brandon, that's all there will be to it. Nathaniel yeah. Brandon will be persona non grata within the whole objectivist movement, and he'll have to begin his life career all over again, which is so naive of hers because it implied that the only reason why people liked or respected me was because she told them to. Well, of course, there was that category, but it was a minority. Uh, when I moved to California, <laughs> I was almost penniless, but I had my complete mailing list. Yeah. So I did a mailing of anybody who lived within 50 miles of here of Los Angeles that was opening an office practice in psychotherapy, and within three months I had a full calendar. Right. And at that time, these were all people from the objectivist world. Right. Uh, uh, which I didn't surprise me in the slightest, but I was stuck by the foolishness that she could actually have believed that that was going to be the end of the story. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Right. So it's uh, your 1970s. You're slowly recovering from all of this, so to speak, getting your feet back on the ground. And this gentleman triggers a whole, obviously it didn't happen just from that sentence, but it, that was a catalyzing moment of clarifying what you had disowned in terms of your own disowned self. Exactly. And then I began, I wanted to experience some of the newer psychotherapy because I was at that time very much in the kind of a cognitive orientation. And I wanted to learn more about the experiential psychotherapy, so I began studying with the neo reikian people, with Gestalt people. Right. And so, of course, that helped me to go deeper also in another way into coming to think of the whole body as my brain, right? If I'm being clear in that, right? And and to have a whole other understanding of uh, the complexities of the whole mind, body, spirit, body connection, right? And, and uh, even your pre and in that light, even your previous espousal of quote biocentric values were, was was curiously abstract. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, that's true. What really also helped along the whole process. I was earning my living doing psychotherapy. And to earn your living doing psychotherapy, you have to be able to deliver positive results for the people who come to you. Yeah. So I now had to test my, certain of my beliefs in the therapeutic encounter. Yeah. And pay attention to what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. So that became another source of relevant input for me. And you didn't really have that kind of practice in the, the previous two no, decades. No, I had a purely philosophical practice disguised as a psychological practice. Yeah, exactly. So nothing nothing gets you straighter faster than watching your clients respond or not respond to what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In, in a therapeutic setting. Uh, like you say, you have to produce results, or... Exactly. And uh, you learn very quickly that nobody was ever led to virtue by being told he was rotten. Ah. Uh, you know? Hard lesson. Uh, and uh, so that gets you off. That you you realized, you start thinking in terms of what is the purpose of this communication. Right. If well, as they, just, as they say in Afghanistan, you can attract more flies with sugar than vinegar. Yes, that's just, that's exactly the kind of easy <laughs> cliche you'd expect from somebody who's native of Afghanistan. Coming from you is a little disappointing. <laughs> uh, what I'm trying to say.